Lively and unrehearsed, it's another weekend, and it's Moral Side of the News. We're glad you're here. I'm John Blim with the WHAS Crusade for Children. With me, as always, is a distinguished panel, Reverend Harriet Aikens Banman, Centenary United Methodist Church, New Albany, Reverend David Harkerold, South Point Church, New Albany, and Father John Stoltz, St. Aloysius Catholic Church. Our first topic on this week's program, tension with North Korea is in the headlines again this week. The latest after North Korea test-fired a ballistic missile soaring over Japan, prompting residents there to take cover. President Biden and the Japanese Prime Minister condemned the threat. So we turn to our panel and ask the question, how much more can that region take of North Korea's aggressions? It's scary. And, uh, you know, zooming out globally, it's just sort of a scary time in the world with things with what Putin is doing. Um, you know, I'm not well read on this, but there's a lot happening in Iran at the moment, revolts and um, uprising. And, you know, as we just look at all of this, there, there's a lot going on. And as I was thinking about this topic, as we think about the moral side and kind of the clergy's perspective, I think secular humanism doesn't have a category to handle this well. Um, there's evil in the world. And I kind of find, especially in times of prosperity or decadence, what I hear from people is uh, there's not really bad and, and there's not really evil. And often that emphasis is on like defunding military and why is the government doing these things? But when these things happen, when, when Kim Jong-un wants to fire a missile and Putin decides to take these offensive uh, actions, I think we're reminded there is evil, and that fits well in the Christian worldview. We have a, a place to understand these things and why they're happening in the world, and I think that gives room to uh, know how to respond with mercy and justice. And so, uh, yeah, just again, I think I think the secular worldview misses an opportunity to understand how all of this works and why we need some of the systems that we need in place. I, I, I agree with you, David. I find it frightening, especially um, in, in some of the articles I read. It's interesting that the, the authors, the journalists use the same phrase, they're flexing their muscles. And the only reason we flex our muscles, right, is to strengthen them, to do something with them. Mm -hmm. So I wonder how is it that um, all of this is happening at one time? And what does that do? Um, for us, how do we as a nation, as we look at our involvement, because Biden had said we're going to honor our commitment to Japan and, and honor our allies, how is it that we honor those commitments without spreading ourselves so thin um, and still continue to offer mercy and help and, and what's needed for what's going on here? So it, it's a very full plate when I look at the world picture as you brought up. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I agree with, with you all both um, and made some great points. I, I'm th I think of, of leaders in our world that some do not think the way that we do. And, and we do come from this perspective that there is uh, as David wet said so well, the sense of evil and sin in the world. And I think that sometimes these leaders who act as bad actors, what they listen to is power. Because that's what they're trying to exercise is power. And some of the actions we've done, the invasion of Ukraine, I can see no reason to it. There's, I see no, I see no justification to it. And it, 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 baffles me um, and baffles many people, I think even emotionally as why this happened. Um, and so, and again, shooting a nuclear missile and then over Japan from North Korea, that, that, that just, the, the use of nuclear power, uh, whether or not the missile was, was nuclear powered or not, but, but the use of nuclear power is a, such a serious moral issue and for leaders maybe to use it sort of recklessly and not recognize it, to threaten with it, I think just, um, just needs to step back and take a pause here. And so, so then power needs to happen, I think, to convince them. And the kind of power I'm hoping is not yet military power. I know we have that. And I know that's in our back pocket. 
But my hope is that we, along with many nations, would operate in a way that's been done before and probably continues, that what North Korea may listen to are when, when a group of nations gather together and say, we will negotiate with you, all of us together, you know, not just a one-on-one -on -one bilateral way, but, but, but in several nations together, and also to set some limits and boundaries on them. And, and hopefully also to use what say we have with Russia and China and say, don't support them, uh, North Korea, because what they're doing is serious and dangerous. Um, uh, but um, David's right, there's, there's, there's a sense, this is very serious and it's sinful to use as threatening postures with the possibility of nuclear weapons and people not knowing maybe really how serious those ramifications are. Could it be such a, oh, oh, just I was just going to say, agreeing with both of you, it's it's politically difficult. You know, I personally, yeah. politically, I'm not eager to get into a war. I'm not eager eager to mobilize yeah. or use our military. But I think that again, in in just in pros, prosperous times and decadent times, the secular world, you can easily say, well, let's just let's defund law enforcement, let's defund military, let's not have these groups. But a Christian worldview acknowledges there is evil in the world. There are there is wickedness, there is sin. And, you know, Romans 13 talks about the fact that God, governance is God's goods, God's good grace. I can't speak today, but, uh, you know, and the goal is not that we would hope to have to use it, but that we would acknowledge that these things are in our world. And, uh, and at times that is necessary. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Harriet, go ahead. No, uh, <clears throat> the conversation is making me think about um, more brought to mind Churchill's famous quote of never, ne never, ever, ever, ever forget, or never, never, never forget after World War II and it, right? And it makes me wonder, makes me think about our human condition and how easy it is to forget when things are going well, right? As you said, David, or um, we're busy with our lives and, and not thinking about the bigger world picture. So um, uh, another, I think, thread of the moral story here is that we remember our connectedness to one another. And Ukraine certainly mm -hmm. did that. And we were all in and watching the news. And that's mm -hmm. all the news now. We don't see much of it anymore. Mm -hmm. I have to hunt for stories on that just to stay up. So there's that moral side of our connectedness to one another and the well-being of one another and, and, and the cultures and children and all the rest of it. And it concerns, you know, yeah, it concerns me yeah, that ahead, players can just step all over that. It, it, one of the things I also notice is that when actors do this, I'll use that word, or leaders do this, I typically see them actually acting alone. So, so here's, and so that makes me also then think that as something like what North Korea shooting a missile, it's really, I, I mean, I'm not thinking, it's not the North Korean people who are doing this. It's the leader of North Korea who are doing this. You don't hear or see anyone else in this decision-making process. Now, who, who knows? That's internal, of course, and we know that. But uh, we also know that he uh, um, makes a lot of these decisions. You know, it seems to me that unilaterally that probably he may do it like that. And nevertheless, so then it also makes us think, uh, as we think of our connectedness, that of a connectedness with a people who probably have no voice. And then they have a leader, though, who is acting in some, in some ways in their name and doing unjust things in our world that just, to our minds, don't seem peaceful or reasonable or, or solicitous to, to other nations. Very good panel. We're off to a good start on this edition of Moral Side of the News. We're glad our viewers and listeners are alongside. We'll go on to our second topic now. Kentucky is one of only 14 states in which only the governor can call a special legislative session. There's a constitutional amendment on Kentucky's ballot next month that would change that. It would allow legislators to call themselves into special and extended regular sessions, taking that power away from the governor. So turning to our panel on our program, Good idea or merely politics to stifle the governor's reach? 
I'll start with this one since I'm the only Kentuckian on the panel <laughs> today. And, but of course, I would welcome, of course, the comments from David and Harriet, of course, you know, and uh, see, because there are principles that we'll talk about, I think, that apply to more than just Kentucky. But, uh, but I, I am against this, this move, and it's not for partisan reasons. It really, it's for the sake of the, of the sense of checks and balances that uh, I don't think that the legislature should, should call a session just for themselves. A, a couple issues that are behind that is that there, there seems to me to be an increased homogeneity politically in our own, um, in our own United States that increasingly in uh, the Midwest and the South, it is increasingly a conservative area, and the and and in the Northeast, it's it's and then also and on both coasts, really, uh, specifically the Northeast and and then the West Coast, typically tend to be a little left of center, and so there's this and people are sort of attracted or are moving there in that sense. That's going to be reflected in the legislatures. I, I think it, that that kind of move means that we need to be more attentive in the way that our governments are run to make sure that there's good checks and balances. And I tend to be personally a little fearful of populism. And, um, and so I, I, I think that, that there needs to be a balance there because I don't think populism is always that self-critical. Um, therefore, in this particular instance, I believe it's good for the governor to still call for a special, a special uh, legislature when needed. Um, at the same time, just to say, to, to, just to stand by my claim I'm not partisan, in this past year or two, the Kentucky legislature has taken upon itself to um, um, actually call for and, and, and um, take charge of some of the committees and populating those committees for the state. I don't remember which one, if it's utilities or education, where, you definitely, where at one point the governor had sole power to do that and the legislature took that on. I actually think that that's a good move. Um, I, I think, again, it leads to a sense of check and balance and, and good power uh, because you know, the reason it, it doesn't necessarily need, need to be a partisan thing is that at some point later on, our parties can change where Kentucky could become, you know, excessively another party and the governor be the opposite, you know, later on. And the rules remain the same. So the idea is really to preserve, I think, a sense of checks and balances for the good of government. Um, and uh, to, to think of that as being really important. What concerns me about the delay uh, about this amendment is the um, the delay it could make, um, the delay it could allow in making um, changes that are needed because the time gets spread out or or it gets tabled and 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 it just um, I wonder is that really in in um, is that really good for the people that are needing those decisions made and. That was that was my concern as well, and I, I agree with you, John. I'm not a fan as I read it, and I'm a Kentucky girl by birth, so I can I can say that with with great emphasis. John, it's interesting. I had almost the same thought process that you had, but I had a little bit different per outcome of that thought process. But I similarly thought about the fact that uh, I similarly questioned sort of how does this help our checks and balances in sort of an apolitical way or in a bipartisan way? Mm -hmm. And uh, I would lean toward thinking for Kentucky, it would help the checks and balances because the people have more voice when both the governor and the legislature have opportunities to speak. Even if the, le the legislature met and uh, in meeting made a decision, the governor would still have to ratify it or veto it. So I think there'd still be a lot of check and balance there. But that being said, I, I just really agree with what you said as sort of a non-political question, is it good for the people? And I, I, hope, I hope Kentucky voters will come with that perspective. Just an anecdotal story. I remember the, uh, the Democrats went nuclear on health care. And I remember that Mitch McConnell said, please don't do this. Uh, the shoe will be on the other foot someday. 
And then when the Republicans went nuclear on the Supreme Court, I remember watching Mitch McConnell. He got a sly little smile and he said, I tried to tell you this would be the other way. Um, and I think what you said is very true. It, it cannot be short sighted and say, well, this is good for the Democrats or good for the Republicans right now. Voters need to really ask themselves, is this a good check and balance for us, no matter who's in what office, because that day will come. And uh, again, my thinking would lean toward it might be good, but I'm not really well read on, on the particular issue. But hope, hope the voters will think about the long term uh, bipartisan ramifications of something like this. Right. Um, just to, to quote a conservative, Antonin Scalia, who said that one thing that separates our government from many others, uh, of course, I think he may be referring to federal government, but it certainly applies to the states that the one thing that separates the United States is a sense of checks and balances. And I have to say that that is so important to our democracy, that we have that and we keep that and keep that in good, that, that, that one branch of government is really checking on another. And, um, and that, that I think is a, good, is a good process. So do you think this is an attempt? I know Governor Bashir got criticized for a lot of his COVID measures over time. Do you think this is an attempt to take back some of that power and put it, in, as David, as you said, in more people's hands versus one person's hands. I'm not incredibly well read on this issue, but I, it would seem that that's the case from what I can tell. And again, I would lean toward thinking that's probably good, more voice for the people, uh, because we do still have those built-in checks and balances in our states, governments. Uh, but I, I, would, I would think so. John, you're the Kentuckian. What are you hearing? I don't know about that. Uh, I, I do know that over time, slowly for the past couple decades, the legislature in Kentucky has gotten more and more power. And honestly, at the very beginning, and even now, I think it's, it's actually good uh, for that to case. For the long history of Kentucky, Kentucky was basically one party and the, and the legislature only met every two years, if I recall. And, and the governor had a lot of power in our state. Over time, the legislature has spoken more and um, with a long time, I, for example, and I think really at its beginning, what I re recall in, of its in exercising, it's, it's somewhat of its independence and its creativity was for Kentucky education reform in, a, in an act that we called CARA, the Kentucky Education Reform Act. And that was a beginning of what I recall, a first step in our, of our legislature acting creatively, creating law for the sake of the state. Um, and so I, I, I think that, that that balance of power that the legislature has sort of come to has been really good. Now that, that there's a supermajority of one party in the legislature, I think it comes a little bit different where the legislature can take a whole lot of power. And, and, and even when the governor uh, should veto any, any legislation, they're not really bothered by it because you have super majorities. And so they can override really any veto that the governor has. And so uh, then they have a tremendous amount of power. And then I think we're moving away from our checks and balances then. And, and that though, is it's a little bit di different from our topic because that is more for political reasons that we don't have our checks and balances at this point. It's because basically the the amount of, of one party, how, how it it's dominates our state. Very good panel. We got about 10 minutes left in this program. I'd like to get in two more topics if we can. So here we go. What would Abraham Lincoln think about today's political climate? Many honest Abes gathered in his hometown of Hodgenville, Kentucky last week for a Lincoln lookalike contest. So I turn to our panel and say, A, what would Lincoln think? And B, have you ever thought of impersonating anyone? Who would like to start? One of the things I most appreciate about Lincoln is um, was his cabinet that he gathered around him. You know, keep your friends close, your enemies closer. And so he pulled together people that had the gifts that were needed during that really turbulent time to make good decisions. And so all the voices were heard. So I, I'm so impressed by that leadership and, and, and hope that that is a lesson that continues to um, uh, belong to the memory of others who are in politics or have the opportunity to, to gather people and make decisions. 
Um, and I'm not sure who I'd want to impersonate. I, I need to I need to think on that one. Fair enough. I'm not sure who I'd impersonate. I've been told I look like Brad Pitt, but I personally don't see it. <laughs> no, that's not true, but I wish it was. Um, you know, I, this is an interesting question because I have often wondered if our founding fathers were alive today, would they be conservatives or liberals? And I don't know the answer or, you know, maybe what would they think of what's going on today? If I'm honest with myself, our founding fathers were progressives. I mean, they were dealing with cutting edge progressive issues, pressing reform and revolution. Uh, it's hard for me to not think they would be progressive. And at the same time, they were progressive in their era. If we imported them into our era, uh, let me back up and say, I know Lincoln's not a founding father, but my mind's just going to, if we imported some of these uh, forefathers of our country into this era, they would be shocked, I think, by where progressivism has taken us. I think they'd be shocked by all sorts of things, uh, even aside from modernity, just our politics would shock them. Uh, so it's hard, it's really hard to distinguish them from their own day, their children of their day. Um, but it's a fascinating question. I, I would hope that they would um, think, hmm, we should have listened to the ladies more back in the day if they were present today, right? If they were truly progressive. Excellent. Have a girl or two at the table. John, how about you? Well, I think um, uh, Lincoln is known for a very sensitive, poetic, an ethical mind and, and in his decision. So I, somehow I think he would bring that to the table and, and look, at, look at the perspective in that way. And um, I, th I think that that would be uh, really important to him. Um, and so I, I think that that's what he would see. As far as who I would impersonate, I would not know. Um, so, Anyway, uh, had, hadn't actually ever thought hadn't ever thought about that, but that somehow, you know, Lincoln, his very image or or who he was, one of the things I think behind the the, the impersonators is that that his image has caught our imagination as something American, and I think that that's why people, um, I think that's why people do it. So they're doing it by the way he looks you know, with the beard and maybe being tall and, and wearing a, maybe a black suit with a stovepipe hat or something. Um, but honestly, I think what's also behind that is that people are wanting to know his mind. You know, he was um, just looking some some of the speeches or as, as we speeches that are so well known, he was such a fantastic writer. And it sort of tells you about his very mind and what he saw and the way he was able to express some things where we look back and say that really was the truth of what he said. John, one quick comment there. I read once someone said Lincoln was the greatest legal mind our country has ever had. And I don't believe he ever went to law school. And they said he was by far the most superior legal mind. What an impressive man. Yeah. And yes, I agree. The address was written on the back of an envelope, was it not? Mm. Mm -hmm. And as far as impersonating someone, I hear, I hear, I look a lot like my cousin Tom. That would, okay, you got <laughs> one more topic we'll sneak in just because she was so important to everyday people. Singing about everyday people and a queen of country music for seven decades, Kentucky born Loretta Lynn died this week. She was 90 years old. With no formal music training, she lived in poverty much of her early life. And she said, when I sing those country songs about women struggling to keep things going, you could say I've been there, she wrote. Turning to our panel, the coal miner's daughter was in tune with the downtrodden, wouldn't you say? Indeed. I, I grew up, um, not that I really wanted to as a child watch, to watch Grand Old Opry, but that's what we did. And I can remember hearing her sing. And I can remember as a child being so sad at these songs because of the, of the stories that they told. And then yet at the same time, I was drawn into them um, uh, because I, I you know, came, came from um, farming people that would sit around in the evenings and tell stories. And, and she just seemed to capture um, 
in two or three minutes lyrically the reality of what people are going through. And I'm, I'm really moved by her genius to do that. A lot of history and talk of culture seems to speak of about the leaders that we have um, and uh, uh, people who are, are, are well known. And then Loretta Lynn and then other um, folk singers, country singers, roots music people are bringing out a culture and a people and a story that, that in some ways uh, can be a little bit hidden or not talked about or not even maybe talked about in this, the political sphere. Um, um, so I think that um, there's, she brings that, I think, to the table, a sense of story of, of where she's from and about her people. It is a story of, of poverty. It's, it's one of, um, it's a story also of difficulty, but also of rising uh, from that too and coming to a different place. And so she's telling those stories. Well, I, you know, I don't... Go ahead, Harriet. No, go, go ahead, David. Oh, I was just gonna say, I, I don't really know if I was familiar with her before reading these articles. I'm perhaps too young or just didn't know the genre, but the I went and I read some of her lyrics and just very powerful moving songs. Again, just dealing with issues of brokenness in the world and, and um, imbalances in power and things that are very real that uh, I think were moving for people, certainly. And she was certainly a voice for women, especially as the women's movement took off. I mean, her song, The Pill, was just, rock, you know, um, am amazingly bold at the time. And yet, um, on the other side of her, her writings um, is her active faith that played such a part in her overcoming hardships. So she was, um, she was quite something. Related to the everyday people, and I think that was the key to her success. And oftentimes my mother-in-law would ask, why are the Irish songs that people sing from Ireland so sad? And I think Loretta Lynn also captured that same thought that she brought up, was brought up in that, related to that, and shared it with others, and others related to her, her uh, style and artistry. Okay, panel, thanks for your time. That'll bring to a close this edition of Moral Side of the News. Thank you. Harriet Aikens Bam and David Harkle Road and John Stoltz. And if you'd like to catch this program again, viewers and listeners, you can go and look at any episode from the past year on YouTube. Just go there and search for Moral Side of the News. And likewise, Moral Side is also a podcast. So wherever you get your podcasts, search for Moral Side of the News. We'll be back again next week with another edition as the conversations continue on our program. Thank you, panel. See you next time. Moral Side of the News is now in its 70th year making it one of America's longest running public affairs programs. Thank you for making it part of your weekend. Thank you for making the 69th annual WHAS Crusade for Children a big success just a few months ago. There's still time to get involved. You can donate anytime. It's always crusade season. Just send your check or donation to 520 West Chestnut Street, Louisville, Kentucky, 40202. That's 520 West Chestnut Street, Louisville, Kentucky, 40202. Or go online and make a secure donation at whascrusade.org and see all the many new ways you can make a donation to help change a child's life.